three. Welcome to Arts and Leisure on the HAN Network. This is our weekly program featuring everything that is coming up in the area's music, arts, and entertainment scene. We will interview local artists, authors, musicians, and even some nationally recognized names who may be performing here in our area. We will have movie reviews and film suggestions from the real dad, Mark Schumann, and etiquette tips from Catherine Michaels. This is your all-access pass, and here are your hosts, Arts and Leisure editor Sally Sanders and our entertainment reporter, Steve Coulter. Welcome to Arts and Leisure on the HAN Network. I'm your host, Steve Coulter. I'm joined here on the couch with my co-host and arts editor, Sally Sanders. It's been an exciting day, one of the biggest days in the entertainment industry with the Oscar nominations being unveiled at 5.30 Pacific time this morning in Los Angeles. It was 8.30 uh, a.m. here in the East Coast. I got to watch it live. It's one of my favorite events that happens every year. And the Twitter feeds. And the Twitter feeds were early. off. They were off the cha charts as always this year. Um, great list of Best Picture nominations. We got yeah. eight this year. Yeah. The Academy uh, has extended the list to ten. They ex extended it back in 2009. and we, we get eight this year. We've got uh, the front runner, I think, would be the Revenant, which earned 12 yeah, I nominations. Think agrees that, but, but who do you think got left out? Anybody? I think there's uh, the big one is Carol. And that seems yeah. to be drawing the most. I have not seen Carol yet. I've seen uh, I think every film on this list. Mm -hmm. I have seen every film on uh, of the eight. Of the nominees. Y yes, I, I have not seen Carol, so I can't really talk to uh, how good it is. But I know Todd Haynes has been on every single Best and Director I think list. Mark, Mark Schumann would. Yeah, would and say Mark Schumann said that was Carol his biggest. Yeah, Carol was the biggest snub. It was interesting though. As I was saying to you before the show, Carol's over here, indie art house films, and on the opposite end is Star Wars. And I feel like the list of 10 was that, and then they cut Carol and they cut Star Wars, yeah, and they found the middle eight uh, well, in between commercial and art house. That Star Wars would make it I, I said it last week on this show that I really thought Star Wars had a good chance because yeah. they want to try to get people to watch the show. But this year, you do see more commercial films. You have The Martian, you have The Big Short, and you have Mad Max, three very big commercial successes. Yeah. And let's not forget, The Revenant did make $40 million and beat out Star Wars last week at the box office. It did. It did. That's amazing. And so in addition to it being uh, the front runner in terms of most nominations, it also has a little box office clout uh, to go with it here in the final six weeks of uh, the movie award season. It has 12, right? 12 it has nominations. 12 nominations, and it's followed by uh, Mad Max, I think, which had 10. Yeah, which is surprising don't you think if you compare them they're both very similar in terms of the cinematography yeah. lots of open space uh, George Miller the director of Mad Max uses not the desert yeah not <laughs> much dialogue at all or plot people could say yeah. uh, it's, uh, Revenant did not get any nominations in the uh, screenwriting categories which we're going to talk about in a little bit here but let's open up again with pictures we have eight the big short is the top of the list and then it goes down alphabetical order. Obviously, you can see there on the screen, uh, Bridge of Spies, the Steven Spielberg movie that came out in October that I was able to see at the New York Film Festival. You have Brooklyn, Sorcy Ronan-led uh, drama about an uh, immigrant from Ireland. Mad Max, we just discussed about. The Martian, which won Best Comedy the other night at the Golden yes, Globe. Yes, a comedy. <laughs> yeah, everyone got a nice chuckle. I think more people laughed at it winning Best Comedy than they did when they were actually in the movie theater seeing well, there it. there were a few funny There were, yeah. Argue, oh, definitely. And then The Revenant, was, as we discussed, I was kind of taking the back burner. Yeah, uh, to ensemble be, pictures are a little harder. To, but to it, did, it did get the supporting actor nod for Mark Ruffalo, which is, which is essential. Great. Which is great. And you know what? If it didn't get that, I think it's open and shut. I think it's... A, Revenant, it's the Revenant's year without Mark Ruffalo, but it, there's plenty of speculation to be left open because Ruffalo's in that supporting category. It so reminds you think me. that indicates that there, there will be votes for oh the yeah. spotlight for I think uh, so. best picture? I think mainly because it reminds me of two years ago in 12 Years a Slave. Uh, didn't have a lot of victories going into that final, uh, I think it was the final three nominations. And uh, Lupita Nyong'o had already won for supporting actor, and then it picked up, I think it was screenplay and then it won for picture. It needed those wins, and so if Spotlight's going to win this Best Picture race, it's going to need Mark Ruffalo to anchor it down with the Best Supporting Actor win. We're going to get into that race, too. Okay. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm really excited, <laughs> yeah. as you can tell. I'm, I'm getting all the categories out here in the opening segment. Okay, so uh, Best Actor. Best, Yeah, you're, you're going to take I'm care gonna, of the Best Actor race. Well, it kind of went to chalk. There's not a lot of surprises in the Best Actor. Well, there were some snubs, though. There were some snubs, there were Will some Smith. snubs. Yeah. Will Smith, um, Johnny Depp. Johnny Depp from Black Mass. Yeah, yeah, that was the first movie we talked about uh, when we went to video back in September. That was yeah. the first one. And Michael B. Jordan, too. I think he For did, Creed, yeah. Yeah, for Creed. 
but um, in the in the best actor slot, I mean, I my heart's kind of been taken by Brian Cranston and Trumbo, but Ama could, an amazing performance. You could really argue for Matt Damon too. That was such a a, a beautiful performance, and and the emotion in it felt so real. There were there were parts of that where your heart was in your throat, and his career best work, in my opinion, yeah. as an actor, really was a tremendous performance for Matt Damon. And I think those are the top three. Well, uh, with Leo, not, Leo's yeah, kind of. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's just open and shut. Do you think he's going to give a King of the World speech when he wins, or? <laughs> I, I wonder if he'll repeat his Golden Globes. Yes. Um, he had a nice message on Sunday night at the Golden Globes. Yeah, he may refine it. I enjoyed that movie, and uh, we'll talk about Aaron Sorkin later. He's another snub, but yeah. Michael Fassbender is very deserving to be there, but I would say right now he's probably fifth in that race. Yeah. My yeah. question to you is, can anybody derail Leo at this point? I really don't think anyone can <laughs> derail Leo. I don't think anyone can derail The Revenant at this point, but, you know, it's, it's a month. It is a month. It's a lot of campaigning. Yeah. We'll see what Matt Damon well, can actually, do. Well, actually, it's a month and a half. It's February 28th. Right. It's six is, weeks, right. Is the, um, they start voting, though, not right away. The yeah, I think it's the 9th is when they yeah. have to send them in by, or yeah. the 10th. Mark would know. Yeah. We'll get Mark to answer that question yes. next Practical week. Practical details with Mark coming up. And then so we've got, those are the first two, the best actress race. Brie yes. Larson won on Sunday night. She's going to be going head-to-head -head with uh, Jennifer Lawrence, who won in the, the comedy uh, category at the Golden Globes. Which, it's surprising that that I think they just like Jennifer Lawrence so much for Jennifer Lawrence. They definitely that, that like Jennifer Lawrence. That's, that's why for sure. she got the nomination for Joy this year. Well, her and Matt Damon carried a lot of momentum, I think, off that Golden Globe victory into those Oscar nods. Uh, I don't think either will but win, but both of them got the the nod because of those victories at the Golden Globes. Do you think, or is it too close to even have influenced that? Uh, I'm not sure what the voting. Sequences you look that. at the actress race and it, you see Rooney Mara and uh, Alicia Vikander are bumped to supporting actress to make room for Jennifer Lawrence. I mean, I, that's my interpretation of it uh -huh. personally. Um, Any snubs? Anybody left? I thought this one went pretty. Been? This one went pretty on par. I mean, the big three are Kate Blanchett, um, Brie Larson for Room, who is the front runner in my opinion, and then obviously Sorcy Ronan, who's kind of the. Uh, challenger so to speak and it'll be yeah, interesting to see lovely. and then you've got Charlotte Rampling from 45 years which is nice to see her get a nomination but it'll be very hard for her to take down Brie Larson at this point I think that she's kind of the clear-cut favorite yeah unless there's some kind of sentimental <laughs> um, but right I, I mean the the Academy does strange things every the year. Academy does very strange things every year and while we're on the topic of actress why don't we t do a supporting actress we just mentioned Rooney Mara and Alicia Vikander who do you like as the front runner in that race Sally I think I like Rooney Mara. I think she's she does an amazing job in Carol. And Carol's going to have to get some want, sort of support. They're going to yeah. want to give an award to that film in some way, and I don't think it's going to be Kate Blanchett this year. Right. So Kate Blanchett just won in 2013, I believe, for uh, Blue Valentine. No, not Blue Valentine. Blue Jasmine. Blue Jasmine. Yeah. Right. Um, Jennifer Jason Lee, though, is pretty <laughs> amazing in The Hateful Eight. Yeah, Eric was just saying that his. Uh, that he saw it, and then they were watching the Golden Globes the other night, and his uh, fiance didn't recognize her at all. Wife, oh. sorry, <laughs> sorry about that, Eric. <laughs> and he, she, she didn't even recognize her because the whole movie she's just covered in blood. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. And uh, yeah, no. And, the, and so frenetic in it too. Yeah, she was the only one that got nominated for a Hateful Eight, which is pretty interesting that the Quinn Tarantino picture got kind of left out. I think there was a lot of sentiment this year about Jennifer Jason Lee saying, "Yay, she's back. She's really good." She's in. She's the voice in Animal Lisa. Yeah, so, I'm excited to see that one, yeah. the Charlie Kaufman movie. And they movie. say that's that's an amazing performance as well. So she's kind of got the career revitalization story yeah, that Matthew McConaughey had a few years ago that the exactly. Academy does like. So exactly. for you said you had Rooney Mara. Any challengers for Rooney in that spot? I know Kate Winslet won well, on I'd, Sunday night you know, for Steve I'd, Jobs. I, I would like Rachel McAdams. Yeah, that'd be great to, to get some some play there. And and I don't know. Again, it's the, the ensemble thing. It's hard to pick somebody out of that. I know Mark Ruffalo, I think, of all of the people in Spotlight, really had the most dramatic. Sure. He's twitching. He's running. Well, he's he, sweating. He, yeah. He's yelling. He's it's typical Mark Ruffalo. He's ordering in pizzas, and he's just he's all over the place. He's definitely got the most to work with in terms of character. But, yeah, Rachel McAdams, similar to my, the point I made earlier, if she wins early in the show, it's... That's a good sign. Yeah, you spotlight. know the momentum train is going for spotlights. So well, and as far as snubs on, on supporting actors, there I were a lot. Say, yeah, uh, my top one is Kristen Stewart. Oh yeah. For Clouds. She got nominated Maria. for a SAG right earlier this year. Yeah, she did. Yeah, she did, and and she, by all accounts, does a, a fantastic job in in that film, 
it's kind of too bad because she's another you could talk about revitalization yeah. and and showing that you're mostly really known serious. for for her her kind of commercial success yeah, exactly. she was trying some real acting chops this year do you have some year. that you, you want to throw in for uh, uh, supporting, supporting actress the snub i had was charlie's theron okay yeah. yeah yeah that was the big one i think yeah, everyone had this morning um, she really made the film for and me and for i think a lot of people that saw it and she definitely was uh, maybe even under Shirley Theron are all yeah. bumped from that category because there are so many lead actresses this year. Yeah. I think um, Kate Winslet may... may <laughs> yeah, I think she's the dark horse. Yeah. I, I would say Rooney Mara, I agree with you, is the favorite, but you can't throw out the seven-time Oscar winner who just picked up uh, another statue of the Golden Globes on Sunday night. Yeah. Yeah. Great performance in Steve Jobs. Uh, definitely can't uh, say enough good things about her performance. So, supporting actor. Supporting actor is one I've been having my eyes on all year long, and I've been saying that they should just extend it to ten nominations. Yeah, there are you, a lot. You of get five, and I can't complain with the five. Christian Bale is the heart and soul of The Big Short. Tom Hardy, career best performance in The Revenant. I mean, almost on par with Leo. He goes tit for tat with him. Just tremendous. Uh, Mark Ruffalo, again, can't say good, enough good things with him. And then you've got Sylvester Stallone and Creed, who won on Sunday night, which yeah. makes things very interesting. And then, of course, the last one there is Mark Rylance, who I consider the favorite still in this race, even though he didn't win on Sunday night. I think there was a lot of shock because a lot of people expected him to win Sunday. He's and an amazing Dice actor and, and I, w I would be really happy if he were the one who yeah. who took it. I think in, with that said, I think Ruffalo is a dark horse and I think Sly, Sly Stallone could kind of get the people interested early on if he wins because the supporting actor is always one of the first awards that they give out and so if they give Stallone uh, the medal early, I think a lot of people will be watching and I think that's good for their rating. So we'll see how that factors into it. Plenty of snubs, though, in this category, because, again, it's just yeah. there were so many tremendous supporting performances this year. First one on my list is actually Benicio Del Toro from Sicario. Yeah. I really enjoyed that movie. It was in my top five for this year. And he's always Yeah, yeah he top. is he's top of his game in this movie, too. Yeah. On par with his traffic performance. Michael Keaton, Lee Schreiber from Spotlight, of course, they all could. Stanley Tucci. Yeah, Stanley Tucci. Uh, they couldn't all get nominated, of course. So I think Mark Ruffalo gets the nomination that most, all of them deserve. Flash, sure, think. of course. And then uh, Samuel L. Jackson, Idris Elba, um, yeah. Michael Shannon. And then I think my biggest one besides uh, Benicio is Paul Dano for Love and Mercy. Yeah. I was disappointed to see that he's uh, still not been nominated for an Oscar at this point. He's a local guy. He grew up in Wilton. Yeah. Graduate of Wilton and High School. he's a seriously good actor. The fact that he didn't get nominated for, uh, I'm now I'm drawing a blank on it, of course. Oh, oh, the, the <laughs> one where so chilling and so compelling that I, yeah. you know, I, I feel really bad that And Bisa No Nation came out on Netflix, for those of you who haven't seen it, it's out, anyone can watch it streaming. Yeah. If with a Netflix subscription. Yeah, and um, that may be one of the reasons why it, it kind of, uh, there's some studio loyalty there going on. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, Netflix will continue to have to fight an uphill battle when it comes to that kind of stuff. Any other comments on the acting before we get into the writing and the directing? The technical awards, so to speak? No, I, I'm just excited to see how it all pans out and to watch the race. On, yeah, on I think one of the most interesting uh, lists is that um, original screenplay. You see Quentin Tarantino doesn't get in for Hateful Eight. Aaron Sorkin doesn't get in for Steve Jobs, so two snubs there. Bridge of Spies with the Coen brothers writing it. Um, definitely seemed to be the kind of surprise as well as Ex Machina. I was happy to see that Ex Machina did get up for an award. Alicia Vikander didn't get the supporting nod there, but it did get an original screenplay nod. Definitely got to consider Spotlight the front runner there, though. I think so. Yeah. yeah. So if you see a pick up an actor award and a, and a screenwriting um, award, it could be anybody's game going into that later round for Best Picture for Spotlight, and so that will be a key category for it. Yeah, yeah. And adapted s screenplay, I, I think the big short, yeah, I think really the Big Short is, is that's is where it's going to win. To yeah, um, Big Short I think had nine nominations or eight, eight or nine nominations. It's yeah, got to win one of those. I think. Yeah, did such a great job with with translating very complicated uh, right. economic principles and and finagling in, into um, some pretty entertaining segments in the, in the film. Um, I think Big Short too. One of the things that people forget about it is you've got four Hollywood just heavyweights. The only two that are interacting with each other are Carell and Ryan Gosling. The other ones are just, they don't even converse with each other. It's a very hard movie to direct. And we'll talk about Adam McKay here in a second. But, like, it must be impossible to have all those stars and they're not interacting. Bale doesn't get anyone to play off of. Brad Pitt is playing off of two young guys who are yeah. re relatively unknown yeah. actors. 
and so you don't have as much uh, charisma or enough. No, the squad that Steve Carell had is. is yeah, they're great. The, yeah. yeah, they are really funny. But you don't have the Leonardo DiCaprio versus Tom Hardy aspect like you have in some of these other movies where yeah. actors are playing off of each other, not as much at least. And I found that very interesting and challenging. And going in and writing a screenplay like that where you know you've got all your main characters and having the restraint not to insert Christian Bale and, you know, one of the last scenes like, oh, here he is talking to Steve Carell. That doesn't happen in the movie, which is good. It's unpredictable and it kind of well, makes the movie to do work. Well, somewhat based on, on Oh, of fact, course. So. That's what I'm saying. It's a lot of yeah. restraint. He could have could have uh, twisted the edges a little bit and made it more fictional, but they kind yeah, of stayed true to the story. Yeah, and you know, um, all these complicated things sure. in a bubble bath or yeah. on, <laughs> on the floor of a casino. A casino, so. right, or in a kitchen. Yeah. Um, and so any challengers there, or do you think that one's kind of a, a sure thing right now with the big short? I think it's pretty much the big short, although... Carol could sneak in there. Yeah, maybe. And again, think, this is the I adapted think, screenplay category. You have The Martian in there, too. That was a yeah, short story I mean, that was adapted. Yeah, I mean, Phil is the person who did the, the adapted screenplay, and it was from a Patricia Highsmith novel that was written quite a long time ago, in the, I think in the 60s. Right. So it, it's, it's an interesting job she's done to, to translate what she understood, and she knew Patricia Highsmith, what she intended into a, into a film. And I think she's done a good job with it. Yeah. But I, I, I do think the big short's going to gonna do this one. I do have a dark horse in this one, actually. Oh, do you? And I was just, I, I don't know why, I was just thinking about it, but Room. Yeah. I can't imagine that Room is as good of a novel as it is a movie. The movie is so engaging, and it makes you just think about it so much afterwards. So writing a story like that, where you have one location for half of the movie, it must be so difficult, and they did just such a good job with it. It really sticks with you. I think the novel had that, too. Yeah, so. did it. I haven't read it, so I can't yeah. comment in that regard, but the movie did just such a good job. And then finally, our last category is director, where there were a couple of snubs and a couple of surprises. We'll start with Room. Lenny Abrahamson, I think, was the big name that came out today. Beats out Todd Haynes for Carol. He beats out Steven Spielberg for Bridge of Spies. Yeah. And he beat out Ridley Scott for The Martian. And I think last week on the show we said that Ridley Scott was going to be the winner in this category, and he's not even nominated. So we now have... Well, uh, we, were t we were giving him it a little sentimental. Sure. I mean, that was, that was the feeling on Ridley Scott. Yeah, we were giving, yeah, giving him the career kind of achievement award. Yeah. Now... I have to say the front runner is absolutely Alejandro Inarritu for The oh, Revenant. Yeah. I don't think there's any question. He has a chance to become the, only the third director to win back-to-back -back winning Oscars. He won last year for Birdman. And, of course, the last time uh, someone even won back-to-back -back Oscars was a songwriter in 2005-2006. The directing back-to-back uh, -back hasn't been done since 1949-1950. Do you know so who that was? I do. It was Joseph Mank Mankiewicz. Thank you. And then John Ford before him. Well, those are... Pretty yeah, duty. pretty good com pretty company, and I think Alejandro director. deserves to be in there. The Revenant, we're going to talk more about it tomorrow. Uh, we're going to do a special Revenant se yeah. uh, segment, but he did such a good job with it. George Miller is the dark horse, I think, in that one. And then the even darker, darker horse is Adam McKay. Yeah, I think, I mean, it, 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 as you say, we'll, we'll know a little when we see some of the, the early wins. Yeah. I'm, I'm intrigued to see if Adam McKay can, can duke it out here, because he... I think he can campaign better than some of these other guys in there, and then he's, it's going to, I think, going to come down to McKay versus an error too yeah, in that category. Yeah, I think it's also, a, a, sometimes it, see, it feels like the Academy is just, you know, trying to be more righteous. You sure. Know, like if they, wa if they want to make a social statement, they might go with Adam spotlight. McKay. Yeah. Oh, that's true, too. I forgot about um, Tom McCarthy getting a nod. Yeah, yeah. It'll be interesting to see how it plays out. It's going to be an interesting race. Those are the top eight categories that were announced this morning in Los Angeles. We're going to be back after a commercial break on the HN Network with more Arts and Leisure. We've got Catherine Michaels coming on to talk about some wedding etiquette. Yeah, interesting stuff. Before we go, though. Oh, that's true. We forgot mention to mention David Bowie and, of course, yeah, Alan Rickman passed away yeah. this morning as well. I mean, uh, I'm sure that Mark Schumann in, in a future column will probably do a tribute to one and or both of those two really good People forget how performers. good of an actor David Bowie was. Yeah. yeah. But a, just a transcendent musician. He worked with so many artists over yeah. the years and, and his last work his last album yeah I just downloaded it. I'm excited to listen to it maybe yeah. we'll do a David Bowie segment next week after I get to listen yeah. to his new CD yeah. and Alan Rickman was just every in, in so many different character roles uh, he could Professor be, Snape and Harry Potter remember chilling. him since I was he eight years old warm. he could be yeah he was very warm you're talking about love actually he's yeah. he's kind of warm in that right 
But his voice was so distinctive. Oh, of course. Yeah. One of the best voices of all time. Yeah, yeah. So and he we'll was, of course, Hans Gruber in, in Die Hard. We can't get out of the segment without mentioning yeah. that. Just well, a very notorious film villain and a great actor. He'll be greatly missed. He passed away this morning right before the nominations came out. Yep. And uh, on that note, we're going to head to break. We got Catherine Michaels coming on to join us on the couch She's talking about wedi wedding etiquette when we get back. Darian Sport Shop is a unique store because it's a family store. A busy mom can come in with kids in tow and find everything she needs for them and even find a dress for herself for Saturday night. And if she's in a rush, she can simply go home and order it from us that night. We'll deliver it the next day. The Darian Sport Shop. We're pretty on the outside and amazing on the inside. Conveniently located with free and easy parking at 1127 Post Road, Darien, Connecticut. Or shop us online at dariansport.com. When you experience a sports injury, you want to get better and fast. Coastal Ortho Express gives you direct access to orthopedic care quickly. Their physicians are fellowship trained in sports medicine at world-class universities and are also team doctors for area football teams. For specialized personal care of sports injuries, go to Coastal Ortho Express. Open Monday through Saturday in the iPark building, 761 Main Avenue in Norwalk or CoastalOrthoExpress.com. Coastal Orthopedics, keeping you on the move. In Pound Ridge since 1993, the Wine Connection is one of America's best wine shops. Visit our beautiful store for the greatest in wine and knowledgeable service. With wonderful values from around the world to collectibles for your cellar, we are your one-stop source. Visit our online shop at wineconn.com and make sure to sign up for email updates. With great offers, new arrivals, and special events, don't miss all the action at The Wine Connection, including tastings every weekend. The Wine Connection, located at 32 Westchester Avenue, Pound Ridge, New York. Do you do a lot of running around but get nowhere when you're buying a car? Visit Pamby Chrysler Jeep Dodge and Ram for the one-stop buying experience and stop spinning your wheels. It's the new year. The to-do list is long and it's easy to feel pulled in many directions at once. Your professional, personal shoppers at Walter Stewart's are ready to check groceries off your list by shopping for you. Save extra time this year and spend it doing more important things. Great food and wine delivered to your home with the same day service. Shop Stewart's online at stewartsmarket.com. I'm Kate Chaplinski. Join us for Coffee Break weekdays at 11 to get the latest Connecticut news, weather, high school sports, and more. News doesn't get any more local than on Coffee Break on the HAN Network. Welcome back to Arts and Leisure on the HAN Network. Steve Coulter and Sally Sanders here on the couch, joined with Catherine Michaels, our etic etiquette columnist. Catherine, happy new year. Thank you. Welcome. Is this your first time on the couch? I feel like the last yeah, time. On the couch, we yeah, stood last time. We stood the last time. Mm -hmm. Welcome back. Thank you. We're going to be talking about a little bit of wedi wedding etiquette. A lot of questions to be asked. Uh, the main one, though, for someone like myself is, if you're a man, do you have to ask your girlfriend's father for permission to marry anymore? What's the etiquette ruling on that in 2016? Not so much. It, up to a couple generations ago, you did. And that was really more about class. I thought this was still the standard, by the way. I'm, <laughs> well, we'll, I'm we'll, shocked to hear we'll that We'll get to what a nice thing it is to do in a minute. But it used to be about class, about finances, about whether the bride's father thought you were would be an adequate provider for his daughter and would take care of, care of her and the custom to which she was accustomed or whatever. Now that's really not so much the case, but it's a very nice thing to do for, for future relationships. Um, really, you more ask his blessing than his permission. Um, it's a very good idea to propose to the potential bride first, because if she says no, that would be a sort of awkward conversation with the father to only find out he thought it was OK, but she didn't. <laughs> Um, if the bride doesn't get along with her father, if you don't get along with her father for some reason, you might skip it and just announce your engagement. Um, if the bride has a stepfather and a father, a birth father, that could be difficult to know which one to ask. And if possible, ask them both for their blessings because that, in any case, Having that little conversation, as scary or awkward as it might seem, does wonders for, fu for future relationships. I'd like to throw in, too, that you might 
include the mother in the in this discussion. Okay. You know, like yeah, I like to know that. Yes. Speak to both parents. Yeah, why not? Yeah. They both have the uh, equal say, right? Yeah. They do. We're not in the 1950s Thank anymore. You. That's absolutely yeah. true. Talk to both of them. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a great point. Okay, so we've got that out of the way. <laughs> so that the next question would be: um, Is it really protocol now to send out a save the date card? And and when we do that, how how far ahead do you do it? Well, it's not protocol to send it, but save the date cards do have some protocol attached to them. Okay. Okay. Um, one is don't ever send one to someone that you probably aren't going to invite to the wedding. Awkward. Awkward. Because they may save the date and then they're waiting and waiting and waiting. And so be very sure of your potential guest list before you send it. Um, save the dates have become a very good idea. People are so busy and crazy and have schedules booked a year in advance that it gives you the chance, hopefully, of having them save the date so they can share the day with you. It also enables them to maybe get a cheaper airplane ticket if they're going to fly, to put in to take the day off if they have right. to, to travel from work, to save money, mm -hmm. um, to book a hotel room, uh, maybe at a discounted cost, etc. So it's a, it's, it's a good thing to do. The second protocol is that you send them up to six months in advance and maybe eight months for a, for a destination wedding. If you're asking somebody to fly to, I don't know, Aruba, uh -huh. that's a whole different kind of planning for them too. So I've received a save the date card and then a month later I get another save the date card for the same date. Oh, mm -hmm. a it double could, booking. It could happen, you know, there are popular <laughs> months for weddings. Sure. And so, what are my obligations if I if I get to save the dates? Mm, the obligation is not necessarily huge, but it's tricky because if you've received the first save the date and you see the future bride or groom and you talk about their wedding and how you've gotten the save the date, and then you go, oh, oops, I'm not coming because you've gotten a second save the date to a wedding you'd maybe rather go to or you think would be more fun. It's kind of awful to do that, but you can. You're not locked in because mm -hmm. you've received a save the date. Um, <clears throat> and things happen. You know, your best friend could pick the same date for his or her wedding or your sister-in-law. That would take priority, and in that case, you explain to the first save the date couple that you can't come. The most important thing is when you receive a save the date and you know you're not going to go or you can't go, let them know immediately. Because then they can cross you off the list and add someone that they'd also like to have be there but didn't have room for. If you wait till you get the invitation and then reply no, even though you've known all along you couldn't go, you're not giving them that, that opportunity. Yeah, and, and people often have sort of the, the B list. Yeah. You, know, you create a list like off screen that people that might get in but are not in yeah. the main <laughs> list. That you'd, that like, you'd to like to have, have either. They're over here and the main list is here. Yeah. It's not infinite budget. Yeah. You know, it's expensive. Oh, I'm sure. And very often that, you know, price is the cost, is the limit. So always respond if you know you can't yeah. immediately. Yeah. Often they have websites now that you can you can kind of post that kind of thing. When when they send out save the dates, I've gotten can you let us know on our, our wedding website. Oh really? Yeah. Oh, okay. But but for for the formal invitation, how how um, much before the wedding does that go out? Six to eight weeks. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and you expect to have responses within? Well, hopefully immediately because that's thoughtful. Um, you might count the six or eight weeks from the date that your reception venue needs an answer. Okay. You know, usually they, you need to let them know about a week in advance how many people are coming because that's their food order and their staffing order, et cetera. So if you back it out an extra week beyond that, then that gives you time to call the people who don't RSVP, and they're always our stuff. And they're always on. Yeah. 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 They're always those last minute stragglers. Yep. Yeah. So Is it my turn? It's, it's <laughs> Steve, has, Steve has the big so, question. Yeah, so we have you on here. I might as well ask. Uh, my best friend is getting married in April 2017. His brother is the best man, but his brother is also underage. So I'm kind of taking the lead charge of the bachelor party and a lot of the responsibility. What do I have to know? I, I'm completely, I'm a tabula rasa, blank slate. Fill me with all your knowledge here. I, <laughs> I, I know nothing about what I'm supposed to do here. You have to know a lot. Yeah. Yeah. 
And the other thing that you're going to have to figure out is how you can be a mentor. I believe you said the brother is 16. Mm -hmm. So you've got to learn, you've got to figure out how to gently be a mentor for him. There are going to be things, he won't have a clue. Most of us don't have a clue. <laughs> I don't have a clue. <laughs> yeah. And he's going to be too young to do some other things. Sure. Things that involve cars and driving. Right. Right? Because he can't do that by himself. So it's a good idea to know what those things are, and I'm going to tell you what they are. All right. Are. Wonderful. Um, <laughs> you, you mentioned the bachelor's party. Yep. And that is a big first job to plan and it's it often seems like a fun idea to surprise the groom with something amazing that's not a good idea <laughs> <laughs> it's really better. so no surprises that's rule number one well you might Small. think that because he's him he might want to go out for a huge night of drinking and carousing and bar <laughs> hopping he might just want a quiet dinner sure you know so you you need to get a feel for what he thinks he wants to do and also find out who else might be invited because he probably has other friends besides you. And yeah, no, I have the list of guys that we're going to go with, yeah. His dad, you know, gets yeah. invited. Um, there's a, a trend lately uh, to plan a destination bachelor party. We were talking about doing that, too. Mm. What are your thoughts? Mm, no. <laughs> no. Stay it, local? Well, here's why. It's expensive. Oh, yeah, I know. Okay, now you're not expected to pay for this bachelor party. Mm -hmm. You talk to the other, to the ushers about it, and everybody pays his own sure, way. Sure, of course. You all chip in to pay the cost of the groom and maybe his dad, but everybody else pays. Pay. It used to be that the best man paid for it. The whole thing? Uh-huh. Oh, wow, thank God I'm in 2016. <laughs> um, so a destination bachelor party, great. I mean, sometimes people go to an island or to Atlantic City for a fun weekend of gambling. It's very hard for some people to afford that because um, it's you know it's expensive and sometimes to take the time because it may also require another day off from work sure. to travel and get ready for it. Right. So if that's what you want to do, go for it. But make sure everybody's on able the same to page, do that. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, also, some of the ushers may be from out of town, and so you and yeah, one's them. from the West Coast. He's going to be coming in. He probably won't come to the bachelor party <laughs> yeah. and the wedding. So it's a good idea to get an idea of how many people you might expect so that you can make your plans and your reservations, mm -hmm. you know, et cetera. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. If you have to have an event, if everybody plays golf, play golf. Or get together a basketball game at the Y or some, like, totally inexpensive group-oriented activity and then go have a nice guy dinner thing. somewhere, a guy thing. Because this is a guy thing for the most part. Yeah. Like a nice hunt. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, a shooting range. <laughs> yeah. Also important, plan it far enough away from the rehearsal dinner that if it's a late night or you indeed go away for the weekend, the groom has time to recuperate and not be exhausted. <laughs> yeah, I think we're thinking wedding. early March of next year. Yeah. So yeah, six which is weeks good. before the wedding. Okay. Other responsibilities. Yeah, this is, <laughs> I was going to say, this is the big list. Okay, traditionally the ushers as led by the and the best man, as led by the best man, buy a gift for the groom. It is likely he will get each of you a small gift as a thank you for serving in his wedding. You give him a group gift. Now this is not in place of a regular wedding gift. This is simply a gift from the groomsman to the groom. And you usually give it at the rehearsal dinner. Okay. So you consult with the ushers, you collect money from them. If it has to be monogrammed or engraved, you take care of all of that, you buy it, and you present it. The best man does. So either this is you guiding the brother, or it's you doing it. Okay. Okay? All right. See, I didn't know that. I'm learning so much here. <laughs> all right. The best man also helps the groom pack for his honeymoon. That sounds silly, but... My dad actually told me that one, yeah. Did he? Yeah. Okay. You make sure also... I don't really know why, but... <laughs> well, passport. Make sure he's sure. got his passport. That's the big one. It, often, the bride and groom do leave from the reception. Right. Even if they're going away some other time, they at least go to a hotel. They don't go home. So very often, they change at the reception site. So you make sure if he's going to do that, that he's got his going away clothes packed in a separate bag so they're easy to access. And then you collect his, his wedding wear, excuse me, and take care of that. Okay. Usually it's rented. He's not going to be able to take it back. But sure. you will. Or 
the brother. <laughs> <laughs> you can delegate some sure, of these of to the brother. Okay, then on the day of the wedding, you make sure that he's dressed and plenty of time for the ceremony. You get him to the ceremony site at least That's an important minutes. one, right? Yep, at least 20 <laughs> minutes ahead of time. Um, you take charge of the bride's ring. I do? You do. Oh, man. From yeah. the groom. The groom has it. You get it from him. You put it in your pocket. <laughs> And then when it's time to hand it over, you this hand is it. a lot of responsibility here. It's huge. <laughs> you, you probably should, you know, have a little <laughs> list. That yeah, you here in I front was thinking you. that the bachelor party and the gift were big. <laughs> the ring, yeah. it's the biggest of all. Biggest of all. Yeah, there may be a ring bearer to handle. So you don't know. There may be. In which case, you don't let go of that ring until it gets pinned to the pillow. Okay. Okay. All right. Also, traditionally, the groom or the groom's family pays the clergy person's fee. You will pay that, not out of your pocket. You will take the envelope from the groom, put that in your pocket, and make sure you give it to the clergy person, either before the ceremony or after the recessional, you run back and hand it to them. So I think it's important that I have a jacket that has 18 pockets or 15? Oh, at least. Yeah, yeah, okay. Just <laughs> getting that one out there. That's something I'm going to need is a multi-pocketed jacket. Well, well so far it's only a normal <laughs> wear, so probably. So, yeah, so far it's only a ring and an envelope. I think it's probably going to be okay. Okay, so before the ceremony, you've gotten him there on time. You wait with him, and then you walk right behind him when he walks in to wait for the bride to come up the aisle after the recessional. It's the best man's job to get the bride and the groom to the car that they're traveling in to get to the reception. If there is no car and driver, to drive them. <laughs> <laughs> I think they'll have a driver, but yeah. Yeah, but then you help them into the car. Sure. If it's raining, you hold the umbrella. You may even hold up the bride's the So this is when I become dress. the butler almost. Yes. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. I'm no longer the friend, I'm the butler. Or the valet. <laughs> the valet. The valet. <laughs> okay. You propose the best man, this will probably be the brother, proposes the toast at the wedding. Mm -hmm. Okay. With a short emphasis, short, short, short on, on the toast. It should not be a long narrative or a whole a whole review of the groom's whole life, etc. And make sure the brother knows to toast the bride if he's giving the toast in addition to making the toast. Okay. Um, I'm just going to copy these notes and give them to Tristan. <laughs> he'll, he'll have them then. All right. If they are changing at the reception site and leaving from there, it is the best man's job to go and get the parents, the groom's parents and his family members, escort them to where the groom is so they can have hugs and kisses and say goodbye before they dash out the door. And then the best man is also in charge of their transportation. Um, that they use to leave the reception, which means usually hiding the car because people will be determined to decorate it, uh -huh. you know, hang tin cans off it and streamers and write on it with soap. You don't want that, so you hide it. So either you go and get the car and, and deliver it right to deliver it, or if you Me you're personally or I hired the driver to do it? The driver will not still be there, so you are the driver. So you oh. have now gone from valet to chauffeur. Oh man! <laughs> or you have, or you do have it delivered. We're just going to be taking off these hats and putting on new ones. It's like yeah. six different things. Okay, and then last, really, if there's a head usher, which there may or may not be, that person generally takes care of collecting everybody's rented formal wear and returning it. If there's not, then the best man does that, and that would probably be you and not the little brother, because he can't drive. He'll be able to drive, I'm assuming, by the time of the wedding. Oh, make sure of it. <laughs> yeah. I think you should take him out for driving lessons. Sure, and sure. that cuts your list in half. Yeah. That, that's about it. All right, perfect. <laughs> that's a pretty You're long ready? list. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm ready now, yeah. yeah. I'm like, I'm kind of processing all of it. We're going to uh, go to our uh, break and end the show, but thank you, Catherine, so much for coming on. I've learned a lot. Well, thank you. It's wonderful to be here and to see both Yeah, we here. can't wait to have you back on the couch again. It's always very informative. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, everybody who's watching at home, have a great weekend. And uh, We're going to do a special show tomorrow. Drive right? Oh, yeah, we should plug our special nice show. We're doing a Revenant-themed oh, show. Oh, recorded Revenant-themed show. Okay, we're going to break, head off to a commercial. We'll be right back. Well, there's still a bite out on the water. Most anglers have decided to stow the gear for the winter. If that's the case, keep one thing in mind. It's always summer at the dock shop. Just because Mother Nature isn't cooperating, doesn't mean you can't see the latest models of all your favorite gear. The Dock Shop is not your average bait and tackle store. 
They offer a wide array of products, including apparel, jewelry, home furnishings, and some flat-out cool stuff, all with a nautical theme, most made in the USA. With two convenient locations, it couldn't be easier to get your fix of summer. Boater, beach bum, fisherman, or simply love the New England coast, this is a unique place to shop. The Dock Shop, 51 Tokenique Road, Darien, 609 Riverside Avenue, Westport, or on the web, dockshop.com. Discover the Wilburton Inn in Manchester, Vermont, a 30-acre historic estate featuring a turn-of-the-century mansion with elegant inn guest rooms and seven large private vacation homes, perfect for ski vacations and holiday celebrations. Special offer on select rooms and houses. Stay two nights, get the third night free through Christmas Day. CNN is called the Wilburton, one of the top eight mansion hotels in America. Call 802-362-2500 or visit WilbertonInn.com for more information. Find over a thousand special stories at Hospital for Special Surgery. Go to hss.edu slash back in the game. I was jogging five months after my cartilage tear. Skiing a year after hip surgery. And playing grandma four weeks after hip replacement. One special hospital, a thousand special stories. See Connecticut patients at hss.edu slash ct. I'm Denise DiGregoli, the host of The Drive on the HAN Network. Join me Tuesdays for some motivational, intelligent talk with a little humor as we visit with people who live their lives mindfully. Tune in to The Drive Live on Tuesdays, 1230, here on the HAN Network. You are watching the HAN Network, and you're not alone. Nearly half a million viewers enjoyed our broadcast in the first five months. Advertise on the network that reaches Fairfield County, Connecticut's most engaged audience. Contact Jessica Murren, Advertising Director, at 203 203- 273-7312 or email jessica at han.network And that wraps our, up our show uh, today. We're going to be back next week at the Prospector Theater talking about The Revenant, which got 12 nominations uh, today yeah. at the Academy Awards. We're going to be talking about movies about the American frontier, as well as the uh, life and career of Leonardo DiCaprio, who is the front runner for Best Actor. It's going to be a great show. Tune in next week at 2 o'clock Thursday. And you can see the revenue at the prospect, as you mentioned, thank you, Sally. That concludes our show for today. Thank you for watching. Drive safe and have a great weekend.